Bonjour à toutes et tous, vous écoutez First Print, votre podcast comics préféré pour une nouvelle émission du format Super Friends, le podcast dans lequel nous recevons les personnes qui font vivre la culture comics et la pop culture par leur travail. On reçoit des auteurs, des artistes, des éditeurs, des galeries, des traducteurs, des organisateurs de conférences. Bref, voilà l'idée avec Super Friends, c'est vraiment d'explorer tout ce que l'on peut faire dans la culture comics. Et aujourd'hui, on profite d'être au festival Quai des Bulles à Saint-Malo. Peut-être que vous entendez un petit peu les, les gens qui passent derrière euh, sur le stand d'Akilios qui a invité euh, l'auteur et illustrateur euh, Ted Neifer, le euh, créateur de Cornet Kremlin, entre autres, donc euh, artiste de l'industrie depuis euh, plus d'une vingtaine d'années avec qui on va pouvoir un petit peu euh, bah, discuter comics. Et donc, cette émission, c'est un Super Friends en VO. On espère que euh, nos auditeurs et auditrices anglophones seront ravis euh, d'écouter euh, la belle voix de Ted. Euh, et donc, on va passer en anglais tout de suite. Now we're switching in English, so hello Ted. Hello. Are you are you fine? Is it, are, is it the first time you, you, you come in France? No, I don't think so. Oh no, no, I've been here uh, a dozen times or more. All right, so. Hmm? Okay. So it's perfect. perfect. Your voice is uh, ringing into my ears. It's it's really nice. Oh, beautiful, loud and clear. So I, I wanted to talk about uh, Courtney Kremlin and the whole Kremlin universe because uh, at uh, the editor Achilles, there's a new uh, Les Chroniques de Kremlin, uh, which is out. Yes. Which is uh, like the, the like the, the new the latest spin-off of the yes. whole Courtney yes. Kremlin series. I I wouldn't call it a spin-off. I'm calling it a sequel series. A sequel, yeah. So, because the original Crummer series is 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 done, I, it was about uh, Courtney and her uncle and how she learns sorcery from her uncle, uh, and um, and then this series is about Courtney's little new little brother, who secretly is her uncle's twin brother who was trapped in the fairy world for a hundred years. So, um, and uh, and so it's it's really more about him. This boy who was like a basically a a changeling or you know he was a, a captive in the fairy world and now he's sort of a stranger to the ordinary world mm -hmm. um and is uh uh trying to find find himself in like who you know, figure out who he is in a world where he's afraid of magic because you know he was traumatized and uh but he doesn't really he can't be ordinary mm. uh oh. Just like that, like this. Yeah, he can't be ordinary, but he's uh, doesn't like being strange. Yeah. So, w what made you uh, want to go back to to this world? Because uh, uh, during the the latest years, you've done other uh, series like Heroines. Uh, so, so, so you wanted to go back to the uh, Courtney Kramer world. Well, I, what what happened is uh, the other series. I mean, they they they. I would put them out, and they do fine, but they didn't they didn't touch people the way Courtney did. Mm -hmm. And it became more and more apparent to me that I, that I had done something really special and wonderful with Courtney, and uh, and I had kind of taken it for granted. And so I went back and I thought, well, what if I did? And I had completely given up the idea. I was done with Courtney. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, what if I did more Courtney? People seem to like it, and maybe there's something there. And a minute later, a dozen new stories just appeared in my head. Yeah, and. Uh, I, and I, I realized that uh, I was not done telling this, uh, exploring this world, and uh, not even close. Mm. Um, and so I started, I started writing, and the more I wrote, the more I realized how much potential there, there was so much more to explore, so much more to do with the character. Um, and adjusting this, what I realized is I had adjusted the series to include Courtney instead of being about her. And that opened up the world to explore other characters and to and one thing I do love is uh, in, in other pop media is when you have a character that's a main character in a story and then they suddenly become a side character around and people see this character from a different perspective, it enriches the character. And I got to do that with Courtney and that was a lot of fun. Okay. But Go, going back to the beginning because it's, it's like almost 20 years since yes. the first issue of Courtney since Kremlin the very first out. one yeah yeah so do, do you remember still uh, what were like the premises that you had in your mind when creating this oh, uh, yeah. whole character you know yeah you very us? clearly well people ask me that all the time so um, uh, at the time there was this thing that was going around in, in uh, America called Emily the Strange and it was clothing and it was like uh stationary mm -hmm. stickers all this stuff uh and there was it was this you know 
there was this like the the it was this girl that was stuck on everything. It was stickers of her and et cetera and notebooks. And there was nothing to her. There was no character there. There was no personality that was just, it was just kind a of, design. It was just design, mm. empty design, mm. pretending to be something of substance. So I thought, well, what if a character like this had a story? And I, my mind started wandering in that, and Courtney came out of that. Uh, so Courtney was my answer to Emily the Strange, but with a story. And then the story kind of deepened and the world expanded. And now I have, you know, seven volumes of it. Yeah. And now an eight, an, an eighth. Uh, although here at uh, Achilles, they publish them two at a time. Yeah. So each book is two volumes. Yeah. And what, was it uh, like difficult to, uh, to, uh, Uh, like grow this universe uh, during the, the years because you had to find new stories, find new characters to develop the, the universe. You know, it's strange. This, this series just seems to just come out. It mm -hmm. never, I never search very hard for new ideas. Uh, Courtney's voice always just appears easily in my head. I never struggle to f remember who she is and find her voice uh, or figure out what she would do. And somehow, I, I mean, I feel like a passenger, and you know, just kind of watching the character unfold. And um, and uh, I sometimes wonder if you know that's how it's supposed to be uh, for the best characters that you're just a conduit. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I really challenge myself and struggle to come up with other characters in other stories. And then Courtney just comes out easily. Mm. So it's never been difficult. And uh, other stories and other characters just fall into place okay. whenever I sit down to write Courtney stories. There's something that, like in the the, the, the Kremlin Chronicle, that remind, re, reminded me a lot of one of your first uh, stories in the Courtney Kremlin, when she uh, tries to uh, be loved and appreciated by everyone. Right. And it's like uh, a, an echo or a mirror of this uh, f first story. And so it's the same story, but from a, fr you know, from, from a different, Courtney's point of view, mm -hmm. a different perspective. Uh, and I think uh, that was... I think I want to do, you know, when, you know, the, the whole, the whole series is about growing up. Mm. And, uh, one of the things about growing up is that you can't tell other people if they, if they need to have the experience, you can't tell them what the outcome is going to be. So in that, in the new story, Will gets, you know, Will wants to be liked. So he, so Courtney makes him a glamour charm and she had gone through her own experience trying to be liked in one chapter of the first book. And, And it didn't go so well because it turns out being liked is not the most important thing in life, especially for these characters. Um, so, but, you know, what, what was fun for me is really getting to assert what a different person Will is from Courtney because for him, he really liked being liked. And Courtney hated it because she doesn't like people. Um, and Will is just so insecure and so, you know, desperate to fit in which is the opposite of Courtney. And so he hung on to it. He wasn't thinking so much about whether he liked the other people. He was too focused on. And that made, that was really fun to explore. Such so you know, two very different experiences of basically the same magic. All right. Uh, would you say that you like, because uh, I feel that like uh, in the, the Kremlin Chronicle that you're still writing for uh, a young audience because you, you, you talk about being like what's important about mm -hmm. rejection about accepting your, yourself and, you were, and yeah. you were also doing this uh, a little bit like uh, the 20 years ago so how do you feel like your writing might have changed or uh, during these years or do you feel like you're still writing for the same audience even though uh, the first readers of Kremlin are now also uh, 20 years older well I'm not writing for I mean I'm I'm always writing for the same audience that's me yeah Uh, and, but I'm also, when I write these stories, uh, what I learned very quickly, uh, writing stories for tweens is that the, the experience doesn't end when you grow up, you know, be, these stories, uh, I think, uh, adults read them in the, you know, like maybe middle-aged adults read them and find them just as relevant because, uh, I mean, certainly with American audiences, uh, The, the, the high school experience, the school experience uh, is still applicable to, I find that it's applicable to my adult life, it's applicable to international policy, it's applicable to 
so all walks of life, the same dynamics are playing out in different levels. Uh, and they're all high, you know, we all continually learn these lessons and then forget them and have to learn them again. This is, this is what it is to be a human, I, I think. Uh, so like the being liked story in different forms, we go through that over and over again, you know, learning, learning how to let go of needing to be liked by everyone, learning the difference between how good it feels to be liked and realizing maybe being liked by someone that isn't worth liking, isn't, you know, is has no value, that kind of thing. And was it uh, like it's also challenging uh, to uh, uh, like uh, have the balance between like uh, the, th the, th the the fact that you're writing for a, a quite young audience, but your universe is quite dark at some, and sometimes oh, and that, there are yeah. monsters and creatures. So you have no also not to be too spooky uh, for this kind of readers. I, you know, I don't tend to hold back mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to being spooky or dark. I find that... Uh, There's what here, for example, uh, I started thinking about what is the greatest threat to uh, in this world, uh, and how can I really up the stakes of Courtney of the threat to Courtney's uh, to Courtney in general yeah. um, as the series went on and I was reaching a climax. And you know, it's easy to say, Oh, yeah, she'll get torn limb from limb and slaughtered like a horror movie. No, that's not that's not that's you know, that's a threat for like a teenage slasher film, but it's not really the kind of threat that you want to put into a tween book. Um, but then I found myself wondering what, what, what would be the threat? And for Courtney, it was losing her memory was the greatest threat, losing her, her, uh, the experiences she had with Aloysius and learning magic and finding herself in magic and in this world. The, th the, the greatest threat of her series is losing that and going back to just being an ordinary kid with nothing to hope for. Um, and this I found such a profound threat that like that is just as horrifying as any monster who wants to tear her limb from limb. In the context of, that, of this story, it isn't... I'm not soft-pedaling the danger. Uh the threat of losing her identity is just as terrifying and just as awful as the losing her life. Um, and I found that uh, by thinking of it that way, I didn't have, I'm not pulling punches by softening the violence or softening the horror. Uh, it's still just as horrifying, just mm. in a different, more personal way. Uh, so I liked being able to, adapt the story to more existential threats than necessarily physical ones because they're very the physical threats you know everybody can go to that mm. to you know can reach for that particular uh danger in their story and it's easy and it's kind of cheap but an existential threat people really relate to it and it gets it goes a little deeper into people's you know souls when mm. they read it i i i hope <laughs> would you say it would reflect your own fears? Like maybe your your worst fear is to lose uh, your mind or so and the, the creation that, that, that you did? I mean, perhaps, but I think it's losing who you are. I mean, for me, who I am was a, the, the process of going through that age when I was, because when, Courtney is very autobiographical in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, any good story should be. Um, you put a lot I, of yourself in this uh, story. I wrote a lot of myself into Courtney yeah. uh, and her experience of being isolated and alienated by other people and, and uh, feeling neglected by her parents and all this stuff is very autobiographical. Um, and so for her being herself, uh, in the first book, it's really, it really touches on her finding this sense of pride in who she is. And it's very hard one. And in the last chapter, she really struggles with you know, this, this sort of monster that comes and steals her identity and takes her place and is, you know, a better version of her than she is, except for this creature isn't because it's popular. When it becomes Courtney Crummer and it's, it's very popular and liked and gets along with her parents and, you know, does good in school. And, um, uh, and the real Courtney isn't any of those things. And so asserting that who she is isn't any of that that being the best version of herself is just being herself. This was a hard lesson for her to learn. And, and that sense of pride in herself was very hard one. And so at the end of the series, taking threatening to take that away forever, 
uh, losing everything about who she is and her sense of self uh, becomes a very powerful thing. And I think anybody could relate to that, but certainly I related to it. Okay, I've got another question about the the the, the critical success of Conrad Kremlin, which is high, and uh, I think it was nominated uh, for an Eisner Award. Uh, it's been nominated twice. Twice, for yeah. An Award. So, how did you feel the first time that you've got uh, this nomination? Well, was, it was. Did, did I mean, it matter to you? Is it something yeah, important? I mean, yeah, you know, it was nice to be acknowledged. I've, I'm not big on competition, so I didn't care about winning. Uh, to me, the magic. Uh, was uh, the what was wonderful was being nominated, mm. uh, and I found out later that uh, I was nominated twice because uh, um, uh, Charles Vest was on the panel and he really liked the book, so he he kept nominating me, uh, and that felt really good too because Charles Vest, uh, what a what an honor mm -hmm. to be admired to have your work admired by Charles Vest, who I had grown up with and I had copied and admired, all, you know. Since I discovered comics, and did it change something in like the 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 the, the size of the audience that you you had? Like, did, did it grow your audience, your readership? Um, no, nobody really. In the it's it's a bit like the Oscars. Like, at some point, the prestige isn't that important to the audience. Uh, I think prestige is a you know is a curiosity more than an important endorsement to most people. I, mean, I don't know that. Oscar winning or even Oscar nominated or Oscar winning movies really I'm sure they get some boost but certainly Eisner's comic mm -hmm. Eisner nominated and Eisner award winning comics I don't think they get a huge boost so it's just like just uh, uh, something like just for, for the image like uh, for... it felt nice it just it mm -hmm. felt like an acknowledgement from the industry all right and that that felt nice what raised my book's profile for uh, pretty well was having a New York Times best selling Mm -hmm. Like getting on that list, because uh, the New York Times they, they you know they copy down uh, what's selling best, and like having having hit that chart and beaten out uh, The Walking Dead for one month, oh. uh, that felt really good. All right. So the the industry, the the whole industry landscape has really changed uh, from like uh, when you started uh, Courtney from from very now. much so, yeah. <laughs> But it was changing even when I started. It was what the way it is now was on the way when I started in the industry. The the books, you know, because originally comic books were these little pamphlets and now that's that's over. So what do you think has evolved the, the, the more in these 20 past years? I was looking forward to it and I was ready for it when it happened. Uh, it's been interesting to really, it's just in the last, the last graphic novel I think was the first, the last Courtney book, was the first Courtney book I wrote that was Originally, I started writing it in, in chapters that would be individual mm -hmm. issues. And then I realized, oh, wait, that's over. I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. So I just let some chapters be long and some chapters be short. I think I broke it up into just two instead of four. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's four or five chapters. And I broke it up into two and it just became uh, easy to, you know, it was easier to write that way. Yeah, because you don't have to uh, like uh, ponder through the structure of, of 22 pages chapters, and so you don't have to like you can ha you can take more space uh, to develop what you want to tell. Exactly, exactly. But do you feel like it's going to be a trend? Like uh, s some people are saying that like the whole single issues market is going to somehow disappear, uh, especially for the creator owned books. We've mm -hmm. got a lot of creators that are like completely uh, uh, skipping the single issues market just to go directly into uh, trade paperbacks. So. Right. Well, I mean, I think ever since uh, serialization became like the the longer and longer form stories started coming out in the 70s and, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, once upon a time in the, up, up until the 50s and 60s, uh, American comics, an individual issue was you pick it up and you're getting a whole story in that uh, they were very brief and self-contained. Uh, yeah. And they, but they were also very. They didn't go very deep. Yeah. You know, they were uh, breezed through. Mm. Uh, and now they take the time, like you'll have a whole 22 page issue that'll just be a couple of conversations. And those conversations go deep. They'll be pretty elaborate. Um, and uh, and so comics have the way they're written has been adapted necessarily because people want those people want comics to go deeper and to have have more complexity 
And so in order to do that, they need to be longer and they need to not be 22 page chunks. And I just got very tired of picking up a 22 page issue and going and getting just barely a touch of story in it. Mm. Um, uh, so uh, you'd rather switch directly to the your, your trade waiting now? I don't. Yeah, I don't see that it's a problem. I think I'm, yeah. I think that it was on. It was inevitable. It was coming. And here it is. Finally, we're here, and I'm I'm perfectly happy about it. So you're still working with uh, Oni Press uh, for for yes. the, the Kremlin? Oh, yeah, I've been with them for a long, long time. Yeah. And you never thought about changing for another editor, like uh, to take back the the I, I think that it's creator. Oh. So you've got the rights. So maybe you could uh, take them and go to Dark Horse or Image or. I you know I mean, I. I suppose if I take Courtney, you know, they helped make Courtney the success that it is. And Courtney is a success. Mm -hmm. And I could then, if I did take the uh, copyright back and take it to like a major book publisher, they might expand that success in the way that Oni couldn't. But that feels very mercenary, mm. <laughs> uh, you know, because they, they helped make it the success that it is. And it's the same with Achilles, you know, like how could, you know, would... You know, if I had published Courtney Crumrin with, say, Humanoids or another company that just it was one of dozens of books that were coming out that month, um, I don't know that it would have gotten the attention that Achilles mm -hmm. gave it, and I don't know that it would have taken off the way it did here. And it's the same with Oni Press. You know, I don't know that it was it became a very quickly became one of their flagship titles, and it's you know it's not as popular as it was, and it's then they they have other big big profile titles like Scott Pilgrim and yeah. books like that. Um, but they, they have shown me this tremendous amount of loyalty because of, because the book was mutually successful for the two, for both of us. And so I can't imagine why I wouldn't show them the same. Okay. So we, yeah, I can sense also some kind of loyalty to, uh, to, to, right. To, you know, to, to they've them. always treated it well and they've always treated me well and they, And uh, if I have, like, I've put out books with them that have failed spectacularly. And they're like, okay, what else you got? Okay. <laughs> they're not saying, well, we, we're not, you're not doing that well. They don't, they're, they're always encouraging me to keep going with them. But is it hard to, uh, to like, to get to a new universe to, uh, to, to submit a new, a new project in this industry? Um... I think uh, because you have a name in this industry, so it's uh, not we that would hard. expect that, uh, like, hey, Ted Nafi is going to do a, a new series. Like, okay, give it, give it to us. I mean, I, I, I don't, I still don't know, and I'll never know what it is about Courtney that did so well in comparison mm -hmm. to everything else I did. It's possible that it was just that I kept going with Courtney, and I only did, you know, two volumes of Polly and the Pirates, one volume of Princess or one Princess Ugg story, and uh, and if uh, perhaps if I had kept going with those books they would have been more successful. Mm. Uh, and they did okay. I mean, both of those books did well, mm. but they didn't do the way, they didn't, they didn't catch uh, a wave the way Courtney caught a wave. And there's also a heroines on Night Dominions or so that you did. Uh... Yeah, Night's Dominion just, it, it just didn't, Dude. it didn't capture the, an audience. Okay. Uh, which makes, it breaks my heart because I really love that series. I've, I thought I had been doing something really special with it and people just didn't see it. Some people did. Okay. Uh, were you contacted by studios to do get a Code Necrom adapted in some form? Did you get a, a, like a, a call from a studio for a Code Necrom adaptation in some form? Oh, you mean a movie studio? Yeah. Or a TV uh, yeah. series oh, yeah. or I've, animated uh, stuff? I would I, see a Code as an animated series really well. I've, I've, uh, it's been optioned many times. I mean, um, yeah. It's been written into a screenplay. Uh, and that screenplay was shopped around and we tried to find, or not we, I didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, but they've tried to find a, a, a production studio for it and uh, it never quite made it. And I think a lot of it has to do with the, it's, Courtney is a fantasy. I mean, it's horror. It has a horror feel, but yeah. it's a fantasy story. And And I think big media still really struggles with fantasy. Um, and uh, they're finally, you know, the, uh, they're finally kind of catching up and starting to get a feel for how to do a fantasy stories. But uh, 
but I find that like that building fantasy worlds the way Courtney built, F, you know, like I know how to do that. I, I grew up on fantasy books and fantasy comics and, uh, and that kind of thing. And so I understand how to like build a deep, like a fantasy world that is, that is deeper than just a puddle. Um, where if you scratch the surface, it suggests this great big rich world. And that's, I think what people really respond to with the Courtney Cameron series is, is that it suggests a much larger world than even it explores. Um, and I think that this is very, I think uh, movie people don't know how to do that. Uh, and, uh, and so I think it's really struggled. Uh, that being said, it's been turned into a, a new treatment and it's being shopped around and, and, you know, I'm getting more nibbles now and it might be a TV series. Okay. Uh, so we'll see. And, and I don't know if it's going to be good. You know, I don't, I mean, I'm not making the, I'm not in the business of making television. I make comic books. And so if it's, if it becomes a TV show, it'll be that TV show. It'll be, you know, somebody else's creation. It'll, whoever's running it. But if it's something that's, looks bad or that you think is bad uh, would you say it publicly um no because i'm a <laughs> professional yeah <laughs> uh i don't know that i would necessarily sing its praises the way that you know one is supposed to but uh but i'm certainly you know i you know the whoever's going to, if a what whatever happens if it gets turned into a tv series it's going to be made by professionals who deserve respect and they certainly don't deserve to be whoever they are and however good a job or bad a job they do, they don't deserve to be undercut by the creator who had nothing to do with producing it. Mm. Um, but you that would say be rude. I mean, that's, that's not, that's not professional and that's, yeah. uh, that's self-centered and childish. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so two, two more questions. Uh, first, uh, how did you, uh, respond to the whole pandemic uh where you were affected in your work uh how well did it i mean go yeah for you? I, uh i i didn't leave the house for mm -hmm. <laughs> you know weeks on end and, and i did a lot of work i did a lot of really good work i did the the new courtney book and i have another series coming out uh, another book coming out also from achilles called witch for hire which in french would be uh, sorcière à engager je dirais mais j'ai pas j'ai vu le titre avant something hein. like that ouais Uh, I, although we've had debates about this because in, in English, a sorceress and a witch are two very, very different, different things. things yeah. Uh, but, uh, because, you know, a sorceress wears makeup and has velvet gowns and jewelry and, you know, and lingerie and a witch, you know, has the broom and the hat and works for a living. And hags, yeah. <laughs> mm. And, uh, I, I have trouble with the idea that this is the same in French. This is the same word that uh, the lady with the, the broom and the, mm. and the hat is also a sorcière. Uh, but, uh, and so I asked Achilles, can we change it change, to which yeah. can I make a whole thing about this? And they said, no, that would make no sense. Okay. So that's, that's what we can expect from you in the near future. So you, you are continuing also the, the Kremlin Chronicles, I guess. I'm there, there going be to be continuing yeah. the Kremlin Chronicles. Uh, well, what happened was when I wrote this first one, like I said, when I was contemplating it, a dozen stories just uh, popped up in my head and I fell back in love with this world. And now I don't want to leave it ever again. I want to keep going. I have at least seven graphic novels planned uh, and more you know, my pub, my American publisher said, you should do a story about the cats again and like go back to the council of cats in those that appear in the second volume. And, and so I'm going to probably do that. And they said, you know, what other characters can you spin off? And I said, you know, let me think about that. So you're going to do like a, a franchise. Hmm? The, the, don't, don't you feel it would be like uh, doing like a, a franchise uh, about the, why not? The yeah. Uh, I, you know, I've been working with Warren who did the color on the Courtney books Uh, he's been drawing a, a series for me and now I want to come up with some more series for him to draw. So, so you could uh, also delegate uh, the work. Hmm? Like, could you also delegate the work that you would be just writing stuff and exactly. someone, yeah, will exactly. be drawing I, it? You know, for some of the series, but I do love, I mean, for me, I mean, the problem with that though, is that if it's Courtney Crummer and I, I have to maintain ownership of it. Yeah. Whereas, With the other, with a pro the project I'm currently doing with Warren, we co-own own it because, you know, the artist is doing, I mean, I do both. And I can assure you that the artist does the vast majority of the labor. 
of creating a comic book. <laughs> you know, don't let any authors fool you on that account. Oh, I'm working so hard. No, you're not. No, you're not. You don't know what hard work is if you don't if you've never sat down and drawn 150 pages of a comic book. All right. Thank you very much at, 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 at for your time. I'm sorry. I'm getting all excited. No, no, it's it's all right. It's it's great to be excited. We and we are just looking forward to it. So uh, oh, merci. So when it's when is it uh, going to be out? Like, what are you planning? Like uh, one graphic novel per year? I'm going to be doing at least one Courtney book per year, and yeah. then hopefully one of something else. Uh, the second Courtney book is coming out same time as the same time next year. Okay. Uh, it's I, it's almost done, so you know you need a little lead time to get it finished. Yeah, sure. Um, but uh, and then the next one after that will be absolutely will be done the year after. So we'll hopefully at least one Courtney book a year for the duration for as long as I say back in love with the series, which at this point is starting to feel like I think it's going to be ongoing. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ted. On espère que cette émission vous a plu. N'hésitez pas à nous faire vos retours dans les commentaires et sur nos réseaux sociaux. Puis on vous rappelle que les Super Friends en anglais ou en français sont des petites des émissions que l'on chérit et à, auxquelles on prête beaucoup d'importance. Donc si vous appréciez notre travail, on vous encouragera, s'il vous plaît, à bien vouloir partager nos podcasts à la fois pour le podcast, mais aussi pour les travaux des personnes qui viennent à notre micro. Merci de nous avoir écoutés et à bientôt pour le prochain podcast. Merci.